um, welcome everyone to this evening's webinar, Four Fifths a Grizzly, with our guest speaker, Doug Chadwick. Um, my name is Julia Spencer, and I'm the Associate Curator of Education here at the National Museum of Wildlife Art in Jackson, Wyoming. And I am, in, I am joining you all this evening from the unceded lands of the Shoshone, Shoshone Bannock, Northern Cheyenne, and at least 25 other tribes that hold deep and lasting connections with this place. We honor their past, present, and future stewardship and care of this landscape. This webinar um, is brought to you through a partnership of two nonprofit organizations, the National Museum of Wildlife Art and the Yellowstone to Yukon Conservation Initiative. Our mission at the National Museum of Wildlife Art is to impart knowledge and inspire appreciation of humanity's relationship with wildlife and nature through art and education. We're particularly excited to welcome Doug this evening um, as it coincides with a new exhibit here at the museum called While They're Sleeping, A Story of Bears, which really explores that connection between human and bears through works of art spanning 200 years. And so before I return it over to Renee um, from the Yellowstone to Yukon Conservation Initiative to tell you a little bit about her organization um, and introduce our speaker, Doug. Um, I just have a few housekeeping items for everyone. So at the end of the session, we will have a question and answer time period. And we ask that you submit your questions through the Q&A function. And you'll see that at the bottom of your screen. So you'll see a little box that says Q&A and you click that and you can submit your questions. And Renee will be moderating that Q&A box um, and she'll pose the questions after the webinar. So we definitely encourage you to type your, type your questions as they occur to you through the webinar. And Renee will keep track of those throughout. If you see a question that somebody else posts that you also would like answered, if you hover over somebody's question, you can see a little thumbs up icon below it and you can click that. And what that does is it upvotes the question so that it goes right to the top of Renee's list. So if you see questions that you like, please upvote those questions so that you make sure those get asked at the end of the webinar. Another thing I'd just like to remind you all, so you can see us, but we cannot see you. Um, so the way to communicate with us is through the chat and through that Q and A function. So again, thank you all for being here and thank you to our partners at Yellowstone to Yukon and to Doug Chadwick for working with us to put on this event. And I'll turn it over to you, Renee. Thanks, Julia. As Julia mentioned, uh, my name is Renee Crisco and I'm the Senior Donor Relations Manager here at Y2Y. And it's so nice to see some familiar names in the chat and many newcomers as well, so welcome. For those of you who are not familiar with Y2Y, our mission is to connect and protect habitat from Yellowstone to Yukon so that people in nature can thrive. We're not for profit and we work both in Canada and the United States. We're dedicated to securing the long-term ecological health of this 2000 mile long region. And all the critters, large, small, bird, feathered and two-legged that reside or depend on it. People are central to our mission. Communities need equal opportunities and rights to thrive. And Y2Y seeks to support human diversity, equity and inclusion and environmental and social justice, and to oppose actions and policies that undermine these principles. Both y y and the National Museum of Wildlife Art are pleased to once again, to present the or Intersection Series, uh, where internationally renowned speakers like Doug Chadwick uh, underscore humanity's relationship with nature. And we are incredibly fortunate to um, have Doug close out our 2021 series. So um, just to introduce Doug, I first heard Doug speak at a series of events here in Alberta where he spoke before three sold out audiences about one of his other epic books called The Wolverine Way. I do believe, I, I think we did actually uh, break some fire regulations in a couple of those events. There are so many people. As a wildlife biologist and National Ge Geographic writer, Doug makes nature come alive. His narratives are compelling, his depictions of wildlife are earthy, authentic, and memorable. After all, he did describe wolverines as badass. He studied or reported on everything from mountain goats and harlequin ducks to whales and Gobi Desert grizzlies. He's produced more than 50 articles for National Geographic magazine, written more than 200 articles on wildlife and wild places, and 14 books about wildlife and conservation. Uh, today, Doug is going to be speaking about his most recent book, Four Fifths of Grizzly, which is at its core all about humanity's relationship with nature. In fact, one reader told me that it completely expanded their concept of what our true relationship is to nature. Others have called the book truly eye-opening, easy to follow, and with some of the most gorgeous photographs they've ever seen. 
Another said that when they finished the book, they felt like they had just received a call to action. Not that they hadn't before, but that there was something about being presented with so much evidence that made them feel a sense of great urgency. So without further delay, I present Doug Chadwick. Thank you very much and hello to all. Um, that's a lot to live up to, Renee. Um, <laughs> but uh, I just want to say hi from, well, to the people here taking the time to come to the bears on the walls of the Museum of Wildlife Art and to Bear 399 with her four cubs currently wandering around Jackson Hole somewhere. And that comes from me and comes from the bears wandering around my neighborhood. We've got our share of grizzlies and black bears on the roads and wandering through town this time of year. Um, but what I really want to do is show you my baby picture. So I'm going to share my screen and hope this works. Oh, here we go. I need to move that. And can everybody see that, my baby picture? Um, yeah, I, I was real young. Um, I was a fertilized egg. Uh, about four one thousandths of an inch in diameter. Um, but look, 99.99% of all the creatures alive on this planet today are invisible to the naked eye. Um, that's life. That's earthly life. And they're microbial. And uh, I started off that way too. So right, right in the thick of things. They were bacteria and amoeba the bigger than I was, but I had plans. Uh, or rather, I had 23,000 genes in that egg and sperm. And they, some of them were new, some were old before life came out of the seas. And uh, I don't mean to brag, but I, I done good. I turned into an adult with uh, 30 trillion human cells. And in me, on me, mostly my guts, my mouth, my skin, unmentionable parts of me, um, I have another 30 trillion or more microbes. They're yeasts, they're protozoans, they're bacteria, they're archaea, they come in thousands of species. And they contain, where I have 23,000 genes, they have millions uh, of genes of all types. And well, that's part of who I am. They're digesting things for me. They're keeping harmful microbes at bay. They are producing vitamins that I can't produce myself or don't get enough of in my diet. They're producing hormones that are very similar to or variations of human um, psychotropic type I mean, uh, hormones that influence our mood and therefore our actions and perhaps our thoughts. So that's me. And within each of my cells, within each of your cells, within all the cells of every living creature on earth, except bacteria and archaea, are these little organelles called mitochondria. And I Forgive me if this is starting to sound like biology 101, but they are the organ, organelles that produce energy. They make it possible for us to move, feel, think. Everything we do, they run our metabolism. And I've got anywhere from a few to up to 2,000 per cell. And mitochondria are modified ancient bacteria. So that's me, the larger picture version, and it's you. When you have mutually beneficial partnerships in nature, the, the term is a symbiosis, right? It's there, we're compound critters. We are joint ventures, we are collaboratives. And I was in the Bighorn Mountains in Wyoming caving at about 9,000 feet, crawling through a tunnel on my back. And my flashlight looking at the rocks overhead 
I was looking at a fossil coral reef, hundreds of millions of years old. Corals, a symbiosis built much of this world. People know, if they know a symbiosis or they know a partnership, they are probably came from uh, being told about it in the case of lichens, which are a fungus and an algae. Except we recently found it's a, almost always two kinds of fungus from different families, algae and cyanobacteria, which also photosynthesize. So they're symbionts, but they're communities of symbionts, like all of us are. And that's called a holobiont. So this gets complicated, talking about individual species and, and thinking of what is a plant, what is an animal, uh, where is the individual in this. So when I look at a tree these days, I see something resembling a lichen because I know that that tree's roots, any tree, and for that matter, any plant, their roots are entangled with hundreds or sometimes even thousands of miles of invisible fungal threads called mycorrhizae. They extend the root system of plants up to 10 times the area. They work, they're so fine, these little threads, they're going in between soil granules to places the finest root hairs can't reach, and they're extracting water and they're extracting nutrients, carrying it to the plant. It's why so many plants are able to survive where they do. And in return, they get a little sip of sugar or starch produced by the photosynthesizing plant. It's a pretty good bargain, but it's basically what the lichen relationship is. And inside, every green plant, we're back to mitochondria in all of the cells, giving them energy to live. They're the spark of life. And also we know about chloroplasts, right? That's the green pigment. That's, the, that's what does the job of using solar power to make food and runs all the food chains around here. And it turns out that the chloroplasts are modified cyanobacteria that arose more than 2 billion years ago, invented photosynthesis, and have been filling the air with oxygen ever since. Thank you very much. So what's a tree? What's a flower? But let's look at, in the case of uh, thorn, whistling thorn acacia on the East African plains, you need to add nodules in the roots that host nitrogen fixing bacteria and nitrogen is what grows structure in plants. And you need to add thorns specially modified by the plant, inflated to become nests for ants. And on the tips of the leaves of the whistling thorn acacia are special sugary little tips called nectaries to feed the ants. So what's the deal here? It's that the ants, while the thorns defend the plant against big grazers, the ants are all over the place defending it from leaf-eating insects, from the small grazers. And in special ridges on the soles of the plant's feet, of the ants' feet, are specialized bacteria that produce toxins that repel harmful fungus and bacteria, further defending the plant. So, I'm gonna, I know this is getting pretty geeky and I'll, uh, we'd rather be out looking at the big critters on an African plain. You would, I would too. But I do wonder what allows such a mass of animals to thrive through the millennia in an arid, drought prone grassland like this. And the answer is the animals that outweigh all those big mammals we go to see on safari and that would be termites. And they are recycling, decomposing and recycling the nutrients in that whole system. And we all know they eat wood. I stole, yeah, they can eat your house. They're on every continent except Antarctica. And I think a lot of people have heard, look, they don't actually eat the wood. They host 
protozoans in their guts that do that job. So another symbiosis, except it was recently found that actually the digestive enzymes come from bacteria that live on the cell walls of the protozoans. So we've got symbionts within symbionts. How are we to think of nature? Well, in the past, we've been very good at categorizing things. We tend to view species as separate from one another, autonomous, so to speak, individuals. We label them, we put them into categories, and it's a very nice organized system. And we feel like we now have a certain level of knowledge, and we do. But nature is a process and a series of partnerships. I'm a walking ecosystem within a larger ecosystem and almost all multicellular animals are. And it's the process, not the parts, that has the dynamic true life of an ecosystem. And it's just hard because we tend to focus on protecting individual species and individual areas, but it's connectivity in nature, to use one word that sums it all up, that is the key to long-term survival and to the richness of ecosystems. Now, why am I going into all this geek stuff? And the answer is because of this population curve of humans. Um, Homo sapiens arose about 300 to 350,000 years ago. And it was only 12,000 years ago that the first million people on earth were around. It took all those hundreds of thousands of years to hit a million. We didn't hit our first billion until the 19th century, uh, 18, early 1800s, the Industrial Revolution. When, I was, uh, when we formed our ideas about how to practice conservation, setting aside reserves here and there, um, it, it, there were between two and three billion people. When I was going to school to learn to do conservation work and understand biology, there were about 3.2 billion and we're now approaching eight. So this is unprecedented in the history of, of vertebrates. So the consequences, if you look on the right hand um, pie chart, you'll see the blue, rep this is the, total living weight of all mammals on land. And the blue is humans, the gray is our livestock, and that little slice between three and 4% is all the wild animals that still exist. So when you hear people talking of compromise and you know we have to work out something for people and something for the wild creatures, um, you know, we're way past that point. And it means how can we get a little more and they can give even a little more of themselves to us. And uh, this is a kind of a, a zero sum game. Now, in the, just the last 50 years, if you look on the left side of the screen, you'll see a 70% decline in the total number of animals with backbones, wild animals with backbones on the planet. So where there, for every place there were 10, there are now three. That's what's happening. And the predictions are we may lose another half of what remains by this century's end, if not before. So what we are trying to do now is conserve nature, but without really understanding what nature is or how it actually operates. And we also continue to view conservation as sort of a a nice or even noble thing to do if we've got the time and money. It's, it's an option, it's a special interest. It's a philosophy, it's a one of many competing groups of people seeking something. And, and yet here we are, you know, when people say, well, I'm, I, I get what you're saying, but I'm really not all that into nature. I say, but look, I just told you nature's totally into you. It shaped you, it made you who you are, and you're also a compound critter. 
so can we go to the next question, please? You know, and because of the way we look at nature, we're able to do things like eliminate 2 million of the greatest beasts the earth has ever held, um, the great whales in a century. We went from millions to thousands. Um, we went from 25 to 50 million elephants a couple centuries ago to a few hundred thousand, and they're almost all in trouble. What else are we losing? Uh, the brain on the left is kind of like yours and mine. It is human brain, and the one on the right is a sperm whale. I can't tell you what's in there, but I can tell you it includes communication and sensory abilities that are unimaginable to us and a very complex social system results. And who knows, who knows what we could learn from a fellow mammal like that. And that's the elephant brain, two to three times the size of ours on the bottom of the slide. So we're losing, we're denaturing the planet, right? And, and I don't mean to have a eco-catastrophe talk here. I, it's just the fact that we're changing the composition and the temperature of the atmosphere, of the skies. We're changing the same things in the seas. And the prediction is that by the year 2050, which ain't far away, uh, the total weight of plastic will be greater than that of fish in the seas. So these are, you know, when we hit this stage, and we're also terraforming the, plant, the land and fragmenting it and changing the composition of all the wildlife communities. So we need to be thinking in new ways. I don't want to give the kind of talk in which I blame people for acting like people. This is what we do. We compete for space and resources. But what worked for 80 million of us or 800 million of us does not necessarily work for 8 billion. And so the question becomes, how do we reverse the trend? Where do we look? And in my travels around the world, i very, very happy coming home because I live in one of the most intact, rich, and exciting landscapes and ecosystems or eco regions left on the planet. There aren't many. And that's the Rocky Mountain Cordillera. And the black is outlining the Yellowstone to Yukon Conservation Initiative eco region that Renee talked about. It has all the species that were originally there. And that can only be said about maybe a dozen, at most two dozen places in the world that I know of. So in 1993, when Y to Y, as it's called, started, um, we have this fabulous network of reserves, the gems from Yellowstone on up to Jasper and Banff in Canada. And, you know, this is, this is one of the great collections of wild places and wild communities. But when I look at it, I see islands. Those are the dark green reserves. And I know that the most of the extinctions that we know about that have taken place since the year 1500 took place on oceanic islands. Why? Because they're isolated. Because Animals are subject to inbreeding. They can't get away from catastrophes, wildfire floods, hurricanes, uh, insect outbreaks, disease epidemics, whatever happens. Um, I know that, and I know the fact that the likes of grizzly bears and wolves and cougars and moose did not arise in little isolated pockets of, of wildness. They arose in big sweeps of interacting wildlife populations. So the point of an ecoregion initiative like this is to try to connect those, that great legacy of existing reserves 
because that's the only way to truly sustain them over time. When we say we're saving nature, if we've saved some samples of it here and there, separate from one another, we haven't saved nature. We've done it temporarily, but it won't hold up. Why to wise approach is to build connectivity. That's the yellow between the green areas. And it can be ones that include human communities, human activities. It just has to be at least permeable to wildlife so they can move, they can have the freedom to roam and exchange genes and importantly adapt to changing climates um, and escape you know, from harsh conditions, whatever they need to do, that's what built grizzlies and moose and, and cougars over time. And that's what Y to Y has been doing. I know I sound like a salesman for it, but no, it's, it's just the, the, one of the really successful programs on the planet that gives me hope that we can do a lot in a relative hurry if we work at it. And it can include humans and Here's the part I like. On the, the left-hand side of the graph is kind of the economy, environment, society, it's trade-offs. Um, how do we keep things going over time and how do we sustain nature? But in fact, societies and their economies live within the environment. And I would suggest a new golden rule for a world with 8 billion people. And that is do unto ecosystems as you would have them do unto you. Nurture, sustain health, allow to flourish. Because in the Y to Y area, especially the Southern part of Canada and Montana, it's very noticeable that our, instead of arguing about is it the economy or ecology, is it jobs or the environment? Our jobs and our economy are running on tourism and outdoor recreation. They're a driving force. They're, in fact, they're the chief source of revenue in Montana that surpassed agriculture a couple of years ago. So part of what's called a nature positive approach to things. And instead of making it a, a again, people versus nature. We, we tend to think of ourselves as separate and superior, largely liberated from nature. This is an old view that's been around for centuries. Um, and I'm trying to find ways to show people we're not. And similarly, conservation is not some optional sort of thing. It's for the long term, it's the only thing that will keep us healthy, vital, and full societies. So you do it on a large scale, wherever possible. We've got a lot of public lands in Yellowstone to Yukon. Um, but the main thing is to prevent that island effect. And that is what's happening. Our reserves, as the world population keeps growing and technology-fueled activities keep expanding, the wild reserves we set aside are no longer in connect connected to one another because the space in between is filling with humans and, and their, their activities. So you need to get those connections going and you need to do it both on the big scale and on the small scale of highway crossings like this one over the Trans-Canada Highway. I call it a footbridge for four-legged pedestrians. And it's interesting to me that the first animals to go across it, and they do it pretty quickly after you construct something like this, are the hoofed animals. But the wolves and the bears and some of the uh, the carnivores are very reluctant. And the most reluctant of all, as far as I know, are female grizzlies with cubs. And a simple road can be a barrier that will divide a population into vulnerable subpopulations. But the bears are now using this and other highway crossings, but it took years to do. Bears, in fact, showed us a lot about what nature needs to thrive over time, the scale at which we need to be practicing conservation, which I call go big or go home. Um, but because they have huge home ranges, they're slow reproducing, they need to exchange genes over a vast area, and they're an umbrella species. They 
pick high quality habitats and they need lots of it. And so where you've saved the bears, there's room for all the other plants and animals that, to which that's a home and which need the same things over time. So that just makes the bear the best. And there have even been studies showing how many species benefit from the protection of any one of them. And bears come out on top as the leading environmental, well, let's call it an umbrella species. They shelter whole wildlife communities. So taking care of them, you're taking care of everybody. This, by the way, is by Brad Rood. It's called, I forget, it's called Connect. I'll move that. Collective Journey, which is why I liked it so much. Um, and this, oh boy, hold on. Try it again. Can you all see that? Can you see it, Renee? Okay. Um, this is William Beard. It's a satirical drawing and it's called, So You Want to Get Married, eh? But I chose this from a selection of some of the art on display at the National Museum of Wildlife Art because we've always used bears as stand-ins for humans. Now, the future of bears, like number 399 in Jackson Hole right now, the bears in my neighborhood, the bears in the wild places of our parks and preserves, they are wonderfully adapted. They have all kinds of traits to master the environment, but their future survival depends more than anything else on what we think they're like, what we think about grizzly bears. And this sort of gets at the fact that they, they uh, are much like us. And you can tell I like brain pictures. I've already shown a couple, but the one on the top left is humans and the one on the bottom right is a bear. And you'll notice that it's bigger than that of a chimpanzee as well as all the other primates pictured. So I know they're smart. They have a big brain. They live a long time. They have wonderful learning abilities. They have, uh, how, they even use tools. Um, I, I worked with a guy studying killer whales along the coast of BC and Alaska and um, I wasn't with him the day he saw, but recorded and wrote about tool using in grizzlies. I said, What's that? Well, it wasn't very fancy, but it was a bear carefully sorting through barnacle encrusted rocks until it finally found one that fit his palm just right. And he could use it to give his rear end a really good scratching. And, you know, when, when an elephant does that with a sharp stick to get it some hard to reach area, using his trunk, um, that qualifies as tool use. So these are tool using critters. And I'm such a grizz groupie that um, I even claim to be four fifths of grizzly in this book. Now, bears are smart. They know a lot of things I don't know, but I know one thing the bears don't know, and that's that I actually am four fifths of grizzly in the sense that I share at least 80% of the same genes. They're identical. I'm actually four fifths all kinds of bears. And I'm at least four fifths, for that matter, all mammals. So I didn't think calling a book Four Fifths of Duckbilled Platypus was going to be great marketing, but um, Four Fifths of Grizzly would get people's attention. But I also just I say bears are my numero uno totem critter. I love being in their presence. I live at a level that I can't when they're not there. But you can pick any mammal for yourself because you're four-fifths mammals too, all the mammals. And so go with a snow leopard, go with the charismatic megafauna, man. And or you could be a bat. More than one out of every five mammals known on the planet is a bat. So there's plenty of things, but a lot of people find them less than charming. But I'm also personally four fifths a really cute red panda. I'm 98% plus identical in the genes I carry with the chimpanzee. 
and a lot of people know how closely we were, we are related. They're not necessarily aware that we are 50 to 60 percent similar in the genes we carry to fish, and 30 to 40 percent similar with insects, like these luminescent beetles or fireflies. Now that means. <clears throat> Uh, I'm a dung beetle too. Yeah, I'm about 30 to 40% of that. But if you think of the work I do in that aspect, um, fertilizing these places where the great big majestic furry cute animals live, um, you can't get one without the other. These are one of the, besides termites, the main fertilizers of, of uh, certainly tropical areas and a heck of a sloth of the earth. Now, I don't know how closely related I am to sea angels. Um, I just put this picture in because I think it's so cool. And I thought people at a art museum would probably think so too. I hope it is. Um, they're actually a, a gossamer kind of sea slug, but I like sea angels better. Um, I do know it's probably 20 to 30% similar. I know I'm 24% a wine grape, slightly more some evenings at a party, you know, but um, I'm 18% a baker's yeast and I'm 7% the creatures on earth that are more numerous than all the stars in the known universe and that's bacteria. And I'm going to read something really quickly. If I can find enough light. I am in a sense alive in a mind boggling number of creatures in a staggering range of environments around the globe for the DNA we share. I leap, I fly, I slither, I shimmer with iridescent scales in the waters off Zanzibar, and I stretch my petals towards the light in far northern Siberia. Um, and I know that sounds maybe even a little woo woo, oh, I'm one with all life, we're all kin, but we are. And we can draw from every creature alive who knows what in the way of building materials, in the way of chemical advances, in the way of health uh, products. We, it's limited only by our imagination. And now we're in a whole new era of molecular biology and technology that allows us to imagine what a resource we have. When we talk about protecting an ecosystem, we're protecting billions of years of stored information and every creature out there is the expert is a success story uh, and knows better than anything else into you know internally how to live in certain in that habitat in that environment and we may need to borrow from an awful lot of that now uh what to do about viruses. I, I like this picture because it kind of suggests how we've been looking at viruses for the last couple of years. Like, do not come in. And I'm, I'm almost, well, I'm hesitant to tell somebody that if you stand on a square yard of ground, uh, approximately 800 million viruses are going to fall out onto that ground in 24 hours. They're everywhere in everything, doing everything. 8% of our genome, of our DNA is derived from viruses. That means from infections of our ancestors, some recent, some back when we were at the fish level. Um, and we got a lot of what's called junk DNA and it's turning out to be very likely viral in origin too. Science does know that the formation of placentas, including the human placenta, is a re-engineered version of a viral gene. And we also know that 
Well, we don't know exactly, but we're pretty sure that we, meaning I'm just, this is just from reading scientific journals, but memory formation in humans in the neurons in our brain appears to be based on a viral gene. Again, modified, repurposed by us. So just a different way of thinking about what turns out to be a huge part of nature and what may revise the way we talk about evolution. It used to be evolution is caused by random mutations. That's what you need to know. And now it look, we know that viruses are carrying chunks of DNA from one species to another and can get reused or repurposed for all kinds of things. And that is causing a lot of the change in nature over time. So just a different way to think about viruses besides putting on your mask and um, uh, <laughs> worrying a lot. Um, and I, if I had more time, I would love to get into this, but I don't. But since I'm 20 to 30% a lot of plants, um, I talk about green spaces, but mostly I'm talking about, I wanna talk about contact with nature. It's been shown in study after study um, in Asia, in Europe, and in the US that contact with nature, especially in a green space, but even in a garden, even sitting on a bench in an urban park, any kind of contact with nature, including the kind I'm sure a lot of you have, which is getting out in the wildest of wild places, lowers your heart rate well, it lowers your blood pressure, it slows your heart rate, it tremendously boosts your immune system, and it changes your cognitive processes, it sharpens them because you go from intense but, but narrow focus concentration, which is, well, anyway, from, from that to a relaxed awareness, which is to say, basically you're thinking more clearly and aware of more things. And it's hard to discuss because the findings show repeatedly these positive health changes that relate to uh, better outcomes with diabetes, uh, heart problems. Uh, gosh, that's a long list of things. I mean, my brain's getting tired here, but it also leads to increased longevity. So, if you are in South Korea or, or Japan and you go on guided forest bathing sessions, which are called Shinrin Yoku, and it means immersing yourself, your, all your senses in a, in a natural area, preferably a green space. Um, it does so much for your health that your insurance company will cover the costs of those guided sessions because they're less likely to have to pay out for a, you know, your own ill health later. So it, it just, it goes on and on and you don't have to get all um, uh, spiritual about it. You can go out and just sit on a bench in a park. Um, it, and it has, we know it has to do with the fact that we have only lived in urban areas for a few thousand years. And we got those 350,000 years of history and our hominid ancestors before us. They didn't live in a wild place. They didn't live in a natural place because they wouldn't have had any words for that because it was all natural and it was all wild. And you've got, I'll just say that these responses to contact with nature are automatic, which a better way to say it is they're autonomic. They have to do with the, the autonomic nervous system that runs your heart and digestion and a lot of other things in your body without you being aware of it. And this is what's responding to contact with nature. So the long and short of it is, uh, we got a lot of reasons to conserve wildlife what we think of as the big wildlife, but also the, some of the small wildlife I've been pointing out. It could be that rare obscure plant over there that does hold a cure for cancer. That's not just uh, lobbying for wildness. It's, it's, it's turned out to be quite true in a couple of cases. Um, there's all the things we can draw from nature. There's the stability of systems that 
include more biological diversity that's going to sustain us over time. But people hear that sort of thing and they go, yeah, yeah, that's, that's great. Um, uh, they I don't, don't get the same response. I want to go up and take them by the shoulders and say, look, would, would you be interested by any chance in being happier, healthier, and living longer? Oh, you would. Cool. Um, how about you save more nature around us? Um, it, it can be a little neighborhood park, which kids need anyway. Um, it, it can be a suburban area, keeping some more open space. Or, of course, it can be a large landscape conservation plan out in the backcountry. But any kind of contact with nature is just good for, for everybody. You know, you can be someone that just just hates greenies, just so tired of these eco guys always coming in and whining about things. Doesn't matter. You're going to get the same effects if you're out in a natural place. So that is a way to get back to a nature positive situation so we don't face a future and our descendants don't face a future of just trying to put fingers in the dike holding the line and limiting the losses but still overall losing more of the natural world that sustains us every year so i want to read one last thing and then i will we'll open it up for questions are we okay renee on on that on time are you nodding okay yeah. Um, okay. An artist commissioned to illustrate the way many folks think about our position in the living world might paint a scene with us as a shining capstone atop a grand pyramid of species. Instead, the growing collection of revelations from recent studies sticks humankind within a tangled skein of other life forms. Your every friend, enemy, lover, dignitary, and desperado, along with every other animal, every plant, and every fungus you'll ever meet, exists as a union. This doesn't refer to being the product of two parents. It means each of us is by nature a collaboration or a collective, a joint venture of fellow earthlings. Our newly realized position doesn't undermine our prowess and potential doesn't make us any less amazing. Our spectrum of biological relationships makes us more than human. And being human was already pretty marvelous, for we possess an extraordinary brand of imaginative intelligence, coupled with social mechanisms for sharing and building upon information that appear to be unrivaled. So make of those qualities all you will. But for goodness sake, don't look for insight from anybody not particularly interested in the fate of nature on a living planet, much less willing to do something about it. That holobiont missed the memo to know thyself. I know you all are able to read, but I'm going to read this to you anyway. Being one with nature sounds like an aspiration. It really isn't because we already are. And that's, that's it. Wow, Doug, thank you so much. There was a couple of comments when you're reading those two quotes and asking who, who are they attributed to? The quotes? Mm -hmm. uh, this one is attributed to me. Um, and the other readings are attributed to uh, a guy who claims to be four fifths of grizzly, which would be me. Um, <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> I do have some quotes of some really good writers in there and some really smart people. But um, those are ones that I, I, I came up with. And I, I would imagine those are in your book. And so um, they are. just before we open it up to Q&A, I just wanted to remind people that Doug's book, and it is, you know, the giving season coming up, um, is available for sale at uh, most of your local bookstores and online. And I'm going to put in the chat uh, the two places where you can purchase it directly from Patagonia, both in Canada and in the United States. So by all means, uh, you know, please buy one for yourself, for your friends, for your family, anybody who's interested in this type of work. Um, for, your, so, for your congressperson. For your congressperson, exactly. Yes, please. 
So we're going to move to the question and answer period. There's already three in, in, in the chat and you can upvote them by hitting the little thumb. Uh, so first of all, we're going to start with uh, a question from, oh, somebody's already bought two books. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to start with a question from uh, Don Hathaway. What are your suggestions for individuals to incorporate conservation into their daily lives? Yeah. Um, you know, that's, that's one that we all struggle with is, is what can we do? And especially what difference does it make with one person in a world of 8 billion? And, and my suggestion, the book has a couple of examples of success stories. Um, one is with island conservation actually at sea. And one is Yellowstone to Yukon, but there are similar projects all over the world. I would say, you know, in the most general sense, just get involved. And of course, everybody needs money, um, but they also need ideas. They need mm -hmm. skills. They need, if you've got um, social media skills, if you've got, uh, you're a physicist, you know, there, there's so many ways if you, if you keep at that, that you can function, you can contribute at a high level. And I would say on a personal level, uh, here in Montana, at least in Glacier Park, and I think in Canada, there's a lot of citizen science programs. And there's a lot of volunteer work um, going out and uh, looking at climate change through the lens of pikas, the little high altitude relatives of rabbits that peep at you from the tail of slopes of the mountains. And they're having a really hard time as temperatures rise. And they're a great indicator. And we need to know more about how they're moving, what they're doing, how the populations are faring. There are other ones where people are going out and helping with grizzly bear research and mountain goat research and that sort of thing. And I know if you're in the Midwest, you know, every wildlife refuge out there is understaffed and underfunded and needs volunteer help with wetlands or with uh, habitat restoration. And I'd also say anyone who's not living in an apartment in a city, or maybe even if they are, could go out and see what it would take to get a little neighborhood park. For, you can call it for kids to play in. Nobody wants to be against that, but you can secretly be going, oh, I want to do a little bit of forest bathing, get my heart rate down and live longer. Um, Oh gosh, I, I mentioned a number of other ones uh, the, in the book, and I, I'm trying to recall recall them. But I, I think the main thing is to make that commitment to realize that again, we're trying to save nature without truly understanding what nature is and how it really works. And this whole thing of us, I, I keep emphasizing some of the geek stuff because we really do think we are separate. We're, we're raised that way in our society, that there's humans and then there's all the rest of creation. And we are qualitatively different than them. And it's like, here we're so bound up in it. I, I think simply talking to people in a way that um, not, you know, again, I don't like criticizing people for doing what's worked so well for us in the past. Um, but just thinking about nature differently and thinking about the unity of of the life we're trying to conserve instead of having conservation sound like a special interest anything we can do to break down that barrier is pure gold awesome thank you uh all right we have a couple of more questions here have you read yellowstone survival a call to action for a new conservation story and also large carnivore conservation, integrating science and policy in North America West. Nope. <laughs> well, there's two to put on your hit list. <laughs> I've read a, a number of similar tracks, but um, no, I, or I should, I can't say they're similar since I haven't read the ones mentioned, but um, I've been involved with um, uh, work in Yellowstone and in the national parks around here for a very long time. And, and uh, it sounds like I better put those on my list. So um, should I scribble that down or can I call that question up later, I guess? 
And um, I, I will, will be able to, I think, pull these off and we can send them to you. Would you? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so here's, here's a pretty loaded question, but we're going to go there anyway. Do you see overpopulation as a problem and how do we deal with it? Yes, I see it as a problem. Um, but it's the overpopulation combined with the attitude that we can take what we want as much as we want for as long as we want. And we'll figure out some fancy fix that gets us out of the resulting uh, mess. We're impoverishing a lot of ecosystems this way and impoverishing ourselves. So um, yeah, overpopulation is, is a key issue and, and I can't think of very many politicians willing to even uh, touch it lightly because it, it just, you know, it's fundamental to our species and to all species to, you know, to keep reproducing. We'd never had to put a check on it before. Something's going to put a check on it and it'll probably be another pandemic. Uh, mm -hmm. We are, we are the dream, absolute dream of every virus out there. They're, you know, us and our livestock. It's an infinite pool of of uh, people and, and livestock to experiment on. And so I, you know, what can, I mean, what can, what can anybody say about populate overpopulation? You can't go out and uh, um, get very far with it before you get totally sidetracked by identity and, and politics and nationalism and ethnic problems and, uh, I, all I can think of is the, that old uh, thing we always try to slide by on, like the solution is more education, but it is. It's also more wealth. The wealthier countries are uh, have a lower reproductive rate. And you don't need eight kids to work the fields, and uh, or you're not going to lose half of them anymore. <laughs> that's the difference. And um, so I think that's the reason. One of the Internet, well, an international group I work with that does community based conservation. The idea, and you mentioned it, Renee, with Yellowstone to Yukon, but it's if, if you're improving the lives and the, the wealth, so to speak, the resources available to the people in an area, you're going to have a, a better conservation outcome because they won't be exploiting the natural resources as desperately. And, and in fact, may figure out ways to incorporate them into their economy that we hadn't thought of before, depending on the local uh, situation. So um, that's a place where if people have skills and want to go do a little volunteer work or find work with one of the organizations doing that kind of thing, um, there could be tremendous benefits for people and, and animals alike. And, and I think that's the best way to do it. And it, if anything that gets us past this, uh, you know, making it sound like a hard choice, are you for people or are you for nature? Do you love these darn grizzlies more than you love human beings? What are you doing defending them? Um, no, it's one and the same. Yeah. Thanks for that. Uh, there's, there's a couple of questions on politics and I just want to point out, um, Doug talked about the wildlife overpasses and just recently, like within the last week, um, US Congress passed an infrastructure bill that includes $350 million per year, I, I believe, for wildlife crossing structures. Mm -hmm. So um, the message of the importance of connectivity is getting out there. And you know the questions are sort of around how do we get decision makers to listen and to see nature? Um, and I guess on one point, I would say everyone's efforts to help them to get to listen is making a difference, especially when we see this, this type of bill get passed. Um, and I know that the US has also recently committed to uh, conserving 30% of land and water by 2030. Do you have any other thoughts on how people might um, reach out and be persuasive to their their political and other decision makers? No, I, that's, <laughs> that's my second flat no. I'm, I'm a dirtbag biologist. My skills are sitting in the cold longer than 
anybody sensible would and continuing to watch animals from my telescope or rumbling through the jungles and, you know, not worrying about what just bit me. Um, no, but as far as uh, working with in politics, not so much. Hands on, on the ground stuff is what I know how to do. And that's why I work with a land trust where the most I have to deal with is a interested landowner who wants to keep her or his property the way it is and keep it available to wildlife and find a way to compensate them for doing that rather than developing it. And um, no, that's that's my field. And But with that original question of what can somebody do, boy, I'd say any anybody that has connections and political skills, um, I sure hope you'll be as active as you possibly can because I, I wish I had them, but not too much. I, I'm, I'm selfish and lazy. I'd rather be out hiking. So. Well, we can send your book to them and highlight okay. a few key things. That might be something to do. Um, and I'm going to just take one last question because we are over uh, and there's just so many great messages in the chat. Um, and this is a quick one from James Fritz. What percentage do you say we are of trees? What percentage we are of trees? Yes. Probably mid 20s, something like that. It's, it's pretty random. I, I've been, I'll bet somebody's got it down because they are, they got DNA from trees that they've analyzed to the point that they can find people who have been poaching logs in national forests or reserves. Oh, wow. And, and if they bust them, they can identify that timber as being, oh, that's from maple from this region, or that's oak from that region, or a conifer. And, um, uh, Probably that, that answer is out there somewhere. I just haven't come across it. I mean, I've seen, and, and mind you, uh, these statistics, you'll, the more you look, the more variability you'll find because identical DNA is a tricky thing to describe because sometimes the genes are identical, but they're in different places on the chromosomes or they're transposed. I mean, it's, it gets pretty technical pretty fast, but um, it, was, it was always said that, look, you're 30% a banana. <laughs> well, yeah, it, you know, it's going to depend exactly on how you uh, define identical, but um, most vegetation is 20 to 30% similar. Thanks. Well, that brings uh, tonight's event to a close. And just before we go, I uh, want to give one last plug to Doug and his book. And I've put the links uh, to head out to Patagonia online and purchase his book, either in Canada or the United States. And of course, you can get them at your local bookstore uh, or at some of the, the other online services. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, of course, if you would like other information about Wado I specifically and the work we do, and uh, one of the things that we do do is we do send out alerts to people to be advocates for nature to decision makers. So you can certainly sign up to our, our um, newsletter and our action alerts. And if you're interested in making uh, a donation, we'll put the link in the chat as well. Uh, we'd, we'd always graciously accept donations to help support our work. Um, and last, but definitely by all means, not the least, I would like to thank our partners at uh, the National Museum of Wildlife Art, who have just been doing such a great job with this, with this intersection series. And of course, to all the interested attendees, if you love this, we encourage you to visit the museum, visit their website. And I'll also put that in the chat for more information on their exhibits and programs. And by all means, go see the one that is currently on, um, on display right now, because it is a perfect uh, accompaniment to this presentation. Can I, so, can I, can I in turn say thank you to Y to Y and to the National Museum of Wildlife Art for this opportunity? It was really great. And, um, can't thank you enough. Well, we just we just love having you. So hopefully we can do this in person. Um, <sighs> thanks to everyone tonight. And thanks again to Doug. Thanks to the museum, National Museum of Wildlife Art. And most of all, thanks to all of you for joining in, watching, 
and um, just caring for nature. We'll be sending this recording out and uh, in the next couple of days. So pass it on. Thanks again, everyone.